So let me begin by asking you all a question. How many of you here read a newspaper on a daily basis? I mean the physical printed edition in sheets that's delivered at our doorstep every morning. That one, not the other formats of news. How many of you? I'm not sure I can see the audience very well with the spotlight, but I don't see many hands. Maybe one or two? Yeah. Two, okay. So now if I rephrase the question and ask you, how many of you read news, digital news, whether it's television or internet? How many of you? That's practically everyone, right? Yeah. So our news reading habits tell us quite a bit of the characteristics across the various generations, the multi-generations that we have in our lives at work and at play and at home. So my grandfather would read the newspaper end to end. I have this memory of my grandfather sitting on a well-lit long veranda at his home, having his feet up on the easy chair and having the newspaper spread out in front of him and peering at it through his soda bottle glasses. He would move sequentially from one column to another, page one to the last. Absolute disciplined sequence. And that's how he read the newspaper for a good part of his morning. My dad would have a slightly different style to his reading. He would look at the main headline, the top headline, read that story and follow that story in page three or page four and finish that and then go back again to the main page for the next story and read that and follow it through. So back and forth for about say 40 minutes of an extended breakfast in the morning, I had a totally different style. I would take a look at all the headlines, page one, editorial, op-ed page, then page six for the global news and last page for sports headlines, decide which of them I want to read and then simply skim through the column of that news content. If any couple of lines popped up at me which I thought demanded attention, I would read only that. Someone quoted the, maybe the introduction and then the summary line, I'm done, I've got the news. I would spend no more than 10, 15 minutes at the newspaper. And in the last couple of decades, especially since a decade, my reading habits, like a lot of other things in life, have moved from print to digital. The newspaper and the books, they occupy an ornamental place in my home now. Most of my reading is digital, 95% of it. My children have an even more deviant way of reading news. They don't, they, they dispense of anything ornamental in their lives altogether. I'm not, I don't think they will ever subscribe to a newspaper or buy a book, rarely. They own very few books compared to the huge library that I have. And they get their news totally from the digital medium. Now, let's transpolate this template to what it says about the four generations, my grandfather to my children. What is it that has changed? Has the habit of reading news and seeking information changed? No. So what has changed is the way we do it. We are more particular about how we seek that information. We want more control about what we put our attention to and we want to customize it in a manner that we get what we want without missing out on anything. Today, of course, the internet has made it more easy. I'm very much aware that when I read the digital news, the search app that I use or the engine search engine that I use is empowered with the intelligence to analyze my searching pattern and give me that kind of news feed that I want topmost. So it saves me the trouble of actually going back and forth a physical newspaper. The, the app does it for me, which is a good thing. It's, it's pretty convenient if you ask me. So across generations, you see this transition in our pursuit of information of what we want in our lives. We want more control over what we, of the kind of information that we want to put our attention to. It is like me sitting in a room, in a board room, and paying attention only to that bit of information that is moving around and shutting myself off to the rest of it. In your context, perhaps it is sitting in a class. I'm sure that 
none of, none of the students would sit through class after class paying attention to every word that is spoken or taught hour after hour. It's only certain bits that you put your focus to and you're good with that. So if you expand this template to a larger template of how we communicate with people in a multi-generation environment, you would see that it's the same thing. We want more control over how we connect with people. I have this elderly, a senior colleague at work who a couple of times complained, in fact, it's his favorite topic, used to be his favorite topic, of how people nowadays don't spend adequate time in conversing or chatting up each other. He would go on about this. I heard him a couple of times, and then I noticed that he wouldn't make any particular effort to seek out someone on his way to his office room or back to seek out someone or chat up with them. So when next time he brought this topic up and I told him, I told him, look, I, look I've seen that you don't make any particular effort yourself of seeking people out and chat, chatting them up. So it's, I'm surprised that you complain that the others don't do it. He said, no, I would want to do it, but then you see, I, I, everybody's so busy on their emails and phones, I don't feel like disturbing them. So I probed a little deeper and then finally he admitted. He said, look, um, actually, it, I'm the one who doesn't want more interaction anyway. I know that if I want to call somebody, I can. I'm anyway uh, part of uh, WhatsApp groups with all of them. I can email them, I can call them whenever I want. So I'd much rather just get on with my work, finish it ASAP and then go home. I made a mental note of saying thank you to him because that woke me up to the realization that very often we are blaming the next generation for something that we ourselves might be guilty of. And are we really guilty of something? Are we really guilty of killing conversation? Is conversation the preferred mode of communication? So I asked a couple of younger colleagues, and what is it that you have against having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, which the elder, the older generation is always saying that you don't indulge in? The answer was, a one-on-one -on -one conversation is, it takes place in real time. So you have to literally think on your feet, and sometimes you don't even have the luxury of thinking. You have to respond so fast that you can make mistakes, versus something like texting, and communicating, because that's so much more easier. You get to edit. In fact, that's what we're all doing. The statuses that we put out on our social media profiles, the story, the Insta stories, the uh, oh, Facebook stories, WhatsApp stories, and even LinkedIn stories nowadays, they are all tweaked to represent to the world, to the people that we connect with, how we want to be represented. So we get to retouch, we get to edit, we even get to delete, which we cannot do with a physical conversation, and that is where the issue is. And I think it's, it's, it's a valid point to note that that reluctance in the younger generation to not get into this act of physical conversations. The older generation indulged in it because they had no choice. That's, that's how people communicated in those days. And there was no other option. And nowadays, if you really want to do it, why should you do it? Unless it's your job to be, ab to be able to converse very well, unless you're in the front line of your job, you're in the s you're, you have to make sales speeches, or you have to impress upon somebody to swing a decision one way or the other. Other than that, why should you be mastering that art? You would anyway be getting good at it with age, because as you grow older, what happens is you are in a position where you need to convince people, whether it's your children or whether it's your younger colleagues at work, or you do have a certain leeway by way of experience, you do get better at it with age. But then to be able to do it at the fly, it requires some inborn talent. Not everybody can speak well. Some are endowed with that talent. It's a, it's a talent that they're born with, or they acquire it. I have a 77-year-old mother. So I spend about one day in a week with her. I spend time with her, uh, asking about her well-being and chatting up with her and so on. And her constant complaint over the years had always been that I don't spend enough time with her. She doesn't get to see enough of me and so on. Until over the years, her very enterprising grandkids taught her 
how to use a smartphone, how to navigate through the various apps, how to use WhatsApp. And soon enough, I suddenly found her a part of three or four other family groups that I had in common with her now, family groups on both sides of my parent, parents. So, and guess what? Over, do you think she complains about me, uh, not seeing enough of me anymore? What do you think? Yes or no? She complains, yes, but the nature of her complaint has undergone a change. Her complaints now are more like, you forgot to put the pictures of the last trip that you went to, I was waiting to see those pictures. Or you forgot to wish that aunt for her birthday, it was yesterday, she would have felt bad. It's that kind of complaint now which I can live with, guilt free. So my one single advice to um, people of the older generation, the takeaway from this, if you want to communicate better with other generations, is to learn texting. That is the single big characteristic that defines the current generation. And then why we should all learn it is because this is the, uh, the millennials. They comprise the largest segment at work. If you were to break up the uh, classical HR manner of breaking up, of segmenting your workplace, workplace personnel is, Number one is the veterans, the mature, older generation. Uh, they are you know, the self-sacrificing kind, uh, Gandhian in their outlook almost, minimalistic living in, in how they dress and how they think. Then come the, what the US people call as boomers, the next generation. The boomers have been the hardest working. In fact, they work so hard that they work workaholics. Very often working well past their retirement. Even the women, you know, they, they, raise, they raise their children and now they're raising the grandchildren too. So they're that hardworking. Then after that come Generation X, which has seen the maximum transformations in their lives. They have seen the move, move from localization to globalization, have seen uh, everything in, at the workplace moving offline to online and they've adapted. They've adapted so much. And to give them the credit, this generation of the, uh, Generation X is the people who have, um, who first talked about things like concepts like work-life balance. They've seen that uh, uh, translated into, into certain changes at the workplace like attrition. Earlier attrition was unheard of. It is with the Generation X that you see ge attrition because of their pursuit of the self. And the same thing translated into their personal lives as well. You, you, see, you see a lot, of, lot more nuclear families taking place in that generation. And marital discord too. Then come the millennials. Now the millennials, like I said before, this is the largest segment at the workplace anywhere now. Okay? Now this is the generation that has been born into technology. They don't know of a world where technology didn't exist. So it's, that's the fundamental reason why they find it so difficult to relate to an earlier generation because that is the generation that has either learned to adapt to technology or doesn't know what technology is at all. This is again the reason why if you want to communicate with that largest segment of the workplace, we should all learn how to text. To bring this back into a, the kind of perspective why I'm, uh, why I'm talking about texting and maybe one other thing that I want to focus on is that I don't want to make this into a kind of gyan session where I give you a do this, do this, do this, do this to communicate better. There are only one or two things that, that are very glaringly apparent about communication bridges that we need to make with generations across to have a more effective communicating atmosphere at work and at home. One of them is this. The second one is about um, our issue with, with assuming things about others, you know? We are all guilty of assumptions, of assuming uh, something that, that we, we have a certain um, segments, certain, say, uh, stereotypes in our brains about other generations. And we try and fit in everything that the person in front of you says or doesn't say into fitting, mapping it with that stereotype in our minds. The same thing with making assumptions. Let's avoid 
uh, making assumptions and assuming, putting the, uh, slotting each other into stereotypes. There are deviants everywhere and all of us everywhere are making an attempt every single day at work and at home. And finally, in spite of all the talk that I do, I must tell you my, that I must confess that I am trying with every interaction that I have with somebody who's younger or older every day at work and at place, I try and I learn. Maybe I'm getting better with time. Thank you. <laughs>